Thank you very much, guys. Uh, thank you for being here in this very warm tent. Uh, we are going to talk today about destroying the world, uh, pushing people into black holes, uh, even maybe, if we get time at the end, destroying the whole universe. This was a really fun, to write con uh, fun talk to write content warnings about. Um, you know, are you going to talk about sort of death or anything dangerous? And it's like, well, we are going to destroy the world. So, you know, there is some sort of content warning there. And so what we're going to do, we're going to do this as a journey across the universe. And we're going to start off with pretty small things that we know about. And then we're going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and further and further away as we go along. So just for a sort of quick orientation, we live on planet Earth. Hopefully this is not news to anyone, uh, particularly here at EMF. And we are about here, more or less. And our Earth is a really special place, right? It's a really special planet in the universe. Not only because it's the planet we happen to live on, right? You know, the place you live is always a, a special place, right? Our Earth is an extraordinary place. It's the only planet we've ever found that we can be sure has life on it, right? Uh, we've been finding thousands of planets across the universe, uh, orbiting uh, faraway stars. So far, our Earth is the only one that we can be sure has living things on it. So it makes it a really, really amazing place. Uh, our Earth also has something very unusual orbiting around it, uh, which is the Moon. And I think it, it often sort of throws people when you describe the Moon as really unusual, because, you know, our Moon's pretty ordinary. You just look up half the time and there it is. Um, I'm not sure, like, I'm going to give you a clue. I would normally do this as a Q&A, but q and is hard in this kind of big tent. I'll give you a clue. It's to do with the size of the Moon. Our Moon uh, is very unusually sized. It's either way too big or way too small, like way bigger than we would expect or way smaller than we would expect. Uh, so by a show of hands, uh, who thinks our moon is way bigger than we would expect? And who thinks our moon is way smaller than we would expect? You are a hard audience to trick. Okay, yes, you are right. Our moon is enormous. It's way, way, way bigger than you would expect. Our moon is actually the biggest moon we've ever found compared to its planet. Um, some people even argue that our Earth and the Moon should, should be counted as a double planet, uh, just because our Moon is enormous. Uh, lots of the planets in the solar system have moons, and lots of the moons are teeny, teeny, tiny compared to our planet. Our Moon is about a third of the diameter of the Earth. Um, and this leads us to our first uh, sort of dastardly, supervillainous question, what would happen if you crashed the Moon into the Earth? And the fun thing is, uh, we know the answer. Because something like this has happened before. Uh, our Earth actually didn't used to have a moon. If you got in a time machine and went back in time something like 4,000 million years, you would find that our Earth did not have a moon. And then, sort of a surprise, surprise, something about the size of Mars, a planet that doesn't exist anymore, came down and crashed into the Earth and broke it into two chunks. And the cool thing is, we now know what that might have looked like. So this is a new simulation that came out. So people took a supercomputer and simulated what it would have looked like when this enormous planet, we call it Theia, came down and smashed into the Earth. It would have looked something like this. I find this incredibly satisfying to watch, by the way. It's, uh, it's like watching a lovely lava lamp, apart from it's the Earth being smashed to bits. Um, and... Uh, Yes, the, the, the nice thing about this, it has revealed the answer to a long-standing mystery. Why do we have this big, giant moon? And it turns out it was formed in this collision. Our moon was formed when it was broken off, when it was smashed apart from planet Earth. Um, so this planet called Theia, we're going to get a better look at it now. This planet Theia comes down, collides with the Earth, smashes it to bits. It's a fun physics fact for you. Basically, anything becomes a liquid if you hit it hard enough. Um, you hit a, hit a planet with another planet, it's going to flow like lava. And you can see this little blob on the right-hand side of the screen is our moon. So the answer to our supervillainous question, what happens if you crash the moon into the Earth, you probably end up just for, uh, forming the moon all over again. Um, this is also uh, has the answer to a really nice question. So I've been talking about this for years, about the, what we call the giant impact hypothesis. What happens when you crash a planet into the Earth and you split it up and you make the moon? People always ask, well, what happened to the planet? What happened to Theia? And you can see it's inside Earth. 
Uh, we figured this out just recently. Like, you know, people have been talk- saying for years, maybe the planet, they uh, crashed into the sun, or maybe it just splashed to bits. Turns out it's inside the Earth. As we now know there's a big chunk of it under Antarctica. There's a big chunk of it under Africa. Like, that's extraordinary, right? Earth isn't one planet. Earth contains the remains of this ancient planet that used to exist. Uh, Just to give you a sense of scale for space, I think this is important. Often when you see the universe drawn in books, they draw it all nice and uh, and, uh, cosied up and next to each other. This is often how they show you the Earth and the Moon uh, in pictures. In reality, if you could get in a rocket and fly far away and then turn around, they would look like this. And in the case you can't see, that's the Earth and the Moon. Things in space are really, really, really far apart. Okay, does anyone recognize this? Almost certainly most of you. Fantastic. I see hand, young hands in the front up. So this is the International Space Station. Um, I, I love the International Space Station. You can see it going over England quite a lot. I think it's one, one of those extraordinary sights in the world, being able to see a little dot flying over and thinking there are people on that. Um, it's going astonishingly fast, more than 25,000 kilometers an hour. Um, and when I first heard this, um, it's, it's almost too much to believe. Here's, here's how fast the International Space Station is going. Imagine that you were going to have a race between the International Space Station and a speeding bullet fired from a gun. And you have this race on a football pitch, right? So the International Space Station goes over the goal line, and at the same time, you fire a bullet from a gun, and they race down the football pitch together. The space station will have crossed the entire football pitch before the speeding bullet has even left the six-yard box. (laughs) It's completely extraordinary how fast this thing is going. And uh, this leads to our second dastardly supervillainous question, what would happen if something crashes into the space station at that speed? Because this is something we really have to worry about. Going at 25,000 miles an hour, things crashing into you at that speed are going to do a lot of damage. And this is why we have to be really, really worried about space debris, right? You might have learned on the, on the news recently, uh, some astronauts were doing a spacewalk and dropped a spanner, and now that spanner is just orbiting around the Earth at something like 25,000 miles an hour. Uh, this is very, very dangerous because when something hits you at that speed, uh, this is what a piece of solid metal will look like when it's hit by a piece of metal weighing a few grams going at space station speed. Unbelievable, right? So yeah, this is why it's very. This is why you should never drop your hammer when you're on a space rock, right? So kids in the audience that grow up to become astronauts, do not drop your stuff in orbit. Uh, you do lots of damage. This is why we have to be very careful protecting our astronauts. Okay, let's zoom out. We're talking about quite a small thing so far, like the Earth or astronauts. If we zoom out, we can see our entire solar system. And I've done the thing that I just mentioned, that we've sort of squashed everything up to get them onto one picture. The solar system is really hard to show on a single picture, just because the planets are so teeny tiny, and the spaces between them are so enormous. It just doesn't look any good on one picture. But if you squash them up to show the sizes of everything in proper comparison, this is our solar system. So you can see the sun is, by a very long way, the biggest thing in the solar system. The planets are almost an afterthought by comparison. Uh, but they're an afterthought, afterthought that matters for you know, human beings as we live in our solar system. So the order of the planets, I'm taking you back to your year five science, goes Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. When I was in school, I think probably when uh, a lot of you guys were in school, uh, we had a ninth planet called Pluto. Uh, Pluto does not count anymore. Pluto does not get to be a planet uh, for reasons that we will talk about in a little bit. But it ruined the rhyme, right? Who used to who learned the, the order of the planets uh, as my very easy method just speeds up naming planets, right? That doesn't work anymore, um, which is very sad because it was the perfect mnemonic. Um, something I get asked quite a lot. What would be the worst planet in the solar system to live on? And you can really take your pick. A lot of planets in the solar system would be pretty rubbish to live on. Um, We can even go through them. Um, Mercury would be pretty rubbish to live on. Mercury is very, very close to the sun, only about 50, only, about 50 million miles away. Um, It's so hot that the, 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 uh, the daytime side of Mercury is something like 270, 280 degrees. It's hotter than an oven. The nighttime side of Mercury is something like minus 200 degrees. Uh, It's the biggest temperature difference in our solar system. So technically, you could survive on Mercury if you lived exactly on the uh, the sort of the terminus between the day and the nighttime. You would have to run constantly around the planet to, to stay at the perfect temperature, but it'd be worth it to stay alive. So Mercury, pretty terrible. 
Venus, even worse. Venus, uh, it has to be the worst place to live in our solar system. Um, in some ways, it's like Earth's twin, right? If you look at Earth and Venus next to each other, they sort of seem like twin planets. Venus is more like Earth's evil twin, though. Uh, Venus is what happens when uh, runaway climate change reaches its very end point. Uh, the temperature on Venus is something like 500 degrees. It's hot enough to melt metal. Uh, the pressure on Venus is enough to just squash you flat. It's like balancing a double-decker bus on your head. And if that's not enough, it also rains sulfuric acid. Uh, thoroughly terrible place. Uh, we even send robots to Venus. They tend to last about 20 minutes before getting uh, burned and squashed and flattened. Uh, so this is one of the last pictures we ever took of the surface of Venus. This is the Soviet probe. that uh, yeah, I think it managed to record something like 40 minutes or something uh, before getting obliterated by Venus's atmosphere. So yeah, I, I think Venus has to be the sort of winner of the annual worst place to live in the solar system award for about the four billionth year in a row. Uh, Earth, currently pretty good. Uh, sort of, you could probably survive about 80 years on average. Uh, uh, it's, it's getting worse. There are some sort of, uh, s s uh, sort of jumped up ape creatures that seem to be uh, putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and making Earth a worse place to live. But f for now, it's the nicest place to live in the, th uh, in the solar system. The only other place really that we could even conceivably survive is Mars. So this is what Mars looks like today. It's this dry, dusty desert planet. In the past... Mars would have looked a lot more like Earth. I mentioned going back in the time machine to see that collision that made the Earth's moon. Mars would have looked something like this in the past. Mars used to have lakes and rivers and oceans just like Earth does. Um, they've all gone now. They've left behind this sort of desolate wasteland of a planet. One of the big scientific questions we're trying to answer is what happened to Mars's water? And we don't totally know the answer. Um, everyone used to think it just sort of evaporated off into space when Mars's magnetic field went wrong. Um, we recently had a conference and some people were suggesting even the water might have sunk down towards the middle of Mars. Uh, but the answer is we don't really know and we're trying to find out uh, by going there. Um, Mars is one of the, like, the best explored planets in the solar system. We send robots there, we drive around, we zap rocks with lasers, we do all kinds of fun things to try and find signs of life. We haven't found anything yet. We reckon Mars is one of the best bets for finding life in the solar system. So far, no dice. Uh, hopefully we'll find something in the future. And as you go further out, things just unfortunately get more and more rubbish. Um, the, yeah, Mercury would be a bad time. Venus would be a very bad time. The gas planets don't even really have a surface to walk around on, right? Jupiter is a big ball of hydrogen. Uh, if you're going to try and walk around on Jupiter, what would happen? You'd fly to Jupiter, you'd open the door of your spaceship, you would step out and you would just fall down into the clouds. And it would really get worse from there. Um, to start with, you would be falling down through the outskirts of Jupiter's atmosphere. After about sort of 20 or 30 minutes, you would start noticing the atmosphere around you getting a bit kind of foggy and soupy. And this is because of pressure, right? If you ever swum down to the bottom of a swimming pool, you felt your ears go funny. That's because of the pressure of the water pushing down on you. The pressure of Jupiter's atmosphere would make things go very, very strange. Um, eventually, uh, the pressure, like the hydrogen, would be compressed into a kind of like a slush puppy kind of material. Uh, you know, like in a slush puppy drink, um, except about 10,000 degrees. Um, in the very centre of Jupiter, things go absolutely crazy. The centre of Jupiter, uh, the pressure is so high, hydrogen gets squashed into a metal. It becomes a very strange substance called metallic hydrogen. Um, so, yeah, so if you were to fall into Jupiter, yeah, my, my, my recommendation is to avoid it uh, because you would sort of fall down until you reach the sort of the slush puppy layer and you would float there and you'd be very sort of uh, squash flat dead. So, yeah, Jupiter would be a very bad time. And the rest of the gas giants would be worse, by the way. Uh, this is just to show you, uh, Jupiter has a storm bigger than the world. It's the biggest and therefore the best planet, right? That's why it's my favourite one. And yet all the rest of the gas planets, as cool as they are, um, would be uh, sort of equally a bad time to live on. Um, I do want to give an honourable me mention to Pluto. Um, hands up, uh, who thinks Pluto should still be a planet? You're all wrong. <laughs> uh, people feel very strongly about Pluto. Uh, I, I think Pluto should just never have been a planet in the first place. Um, I'll, tell, I'll tell you why. Hopefully I can cut, try and convince you. So we found Pluto around 100 years ago in 1930. And when we found it, everyone was like, you know, yay, cool, we found another planet. What we didn't realize is that Pluto is part of an asteroid belt. Uh, there's the asteroid belt that's very famous between Mars and Jupiter. 
there's another asteroid belt out past Neptune called the Kuiper Belt. And it turns out that Pluto is just one of the big things in the Kuiper Belt. And we know that because we started finding more and more and more just like Pluto. Uh, there's, one called, uh, there's one called Make Make, there's one called Eris, there's one called Albion, there's one called Sedna. And our best like, scientific guess is that there's maybe 100,000 things just like Pluto in the Kuiper Belt. So scientists had a problem, because we were like, okay, we're calling Pluto a planet. There's probably 100,000 things just like Pluto. If we're being fair, we have to call them all planets. We're going to end up with 100,000 planets in the solar system. So we changed the rules, and we just made up a new rule that said, if you're part of an asteroid belt, you don't count. And that was it. We literally just made up a new rule to avoid there being 100,000 planets. So this is the problem. This is why Pluto can't be a planet. There's no way to have Pluto to be a planet and to be consistent and not have 100,000 planets in the solar system. Like, imagine the mnemonic. You'd have to remember to remember that, right? Uh, so, yeah, we changed the rules. Pluto doesn't count anymore. It's a shame because it looks very cool. Uh, but there you go. Also, bonus fun fact. Uh, the astronomer that led the campaign to have Pluto demoted was called Mike Brown. Uh, he wrote a book all about this. You can read called Why I Killed Pluto and Why It Had It Coming. Um, so, it's very fun. People feel very strongly about Pluto. Um, Okay, let's zoom out again and have a look at this. So this is a picture of our solar system, a, a bit more like it looks in real life. The coloured lines are not really there. Um, so what this is showing you is the planets orbiting around the sun. Now, the reason the planets are orbiting around the sun is, of course, taking you back to your sort of primary school science again, is the sun's gravity, right? It's the gravity of the sun. Now, who here has heard people saying there's no gravity in space? Like me, I hear it constantly. It's completely not true. Uh, there's gravity everywhere in space. If there was no gravity in space, the whole solar system would just sort of fly apart, right? If there was no gravity in space, the Earth would just whiz off into interstellar darkness. So there is gravity everywhere in space. But the gravity can be different on different planets, which leads us to our next super villainous question. Would the gravity on Jupiter squash you. And I found a very nice video that illustrates this. Um, we're not going to squash a person, that would be very gory, uh, we're going to squash a car instead. And what we're going to do, we're going to simulate dropping something heavy on this car in different gravitational fields to see what it looks like. So this is Earth gravity, this is our reference point. If we drop something on somewhere with a weaker gravity, you can see it comes down more gently, everything's a bit more chill. Mars, the gravity is about 40% of Earth. The moon, on the moon, the gravity is about one-sixth of Earth gravity. You can see, very, very gentle, very, very chill. Uh, Pluto, the gravity is even weaker. You can see, it takes, its, uh, takes its time coming down. Uh, the car is basically drivable after this. It's absolutely fine. Very nice. If you turn the gravity up, things aren't quite as, uh, aren't quite as nice. So the gravity on Uranus is pretty bad, uh, just slightly stronger than Earth, same as Saturn. The gravity on Jupiter is very extreme. The car does not have a good time on Jupiter, you can see. <laughs> All of that is nothing compared to the gravity of the Sun. The gravity of the Sun is so much stronger than everything else in our solar system. <laughs> so that's why the Sun's gravity holds the solar system together. It's 300,000 times more massive than the Earth. And uh, yes, uh, it's, uh, if you were on the Sun, even apart from the heat, you would have a very bad time. Now, who knows the name of the nearest star to Earth? You can see. Uh, who are you? Shout it out. Proxima Centauri. Uh, there is a closer star than Proxima Centauri. Who knows it? The sun, exactly. It was a trick question. Um, but it really shouldn't be a trick question, right? The reason it sounds like a trick question is because we're so used to thinking of the sun and the stars as different things, right? The sun's the big bright thing that gives you sunburn and makes the tent you're talking in very, very hot. Uh, the stars are the little twinkly things uh, that are very far away. They're fundamentally different, except they're not, right? The only reason the sun looks special to us is because we're really, really close to it. Um, if we could go and just pick any single star in the sky, um, and get closer and closer to it, it would eventually, it would look very much like our sun. Okay, here is a, a super villainous question I get asked quite a lot. When will the sun blow up? 
Right, so our sun was born, along with the rest of our solar system, about 5,000 million years ago. And it's burning, right, as we're all very aware of in this tent, right? The sun is burning fuel and making energy. And one day, the fuel is going to run out. Uh, so what happens when the fuel, uh, fuel runs out of a star? They explode, right? That is actually not true of our sun. Only big stars explode. Our sun, believe it or not, is actually a very small star. So yes, like, just like people, like stars are born and they live their lives and then eventually they die. But what happens when they die depends on the size of the star. Very, very big stars explode in these very dramatic supernovae, uh, but tiny little weedy puny stars like our sun do not do that. This is possibly the only piece of good news in this talk, by the way, that our sun is not going to explode. Um, instead, uh, the news does not stay good for long, instead our sun is going to swell up into something called a red giant, and it's going to be very pretty when it does that. Uh, this is a red giant star uh, surrounded by the outer layers of the star being puffed off into space. This is a picture with the, taken with the new James Webb Space Telescope. So this is the future of our sun. This is what our sun is going to look like in thousands of millions of years' time. Uh, when it swells up into a red giant, it's going to swallow Mercury and swallow Venus. And it's not going to swallow the Earth, as far as we can tell, which sounds like good news until you realize we're going to end up very, very close to a surface of the star and look something like this. So this is the ultimate fate of the Earth, right? We're going to be burnt to a crisp uh, by the dying sun. The good news is it's not going to happen for about 5,000 million years' time. Um, I was in a school talking about this a while back, by the way, and um, you know, I was talking about how the sun was going to die in 5 billion years' time. And there was this little girl that was starting to get very distressed. Um, but I, you know, and I, when I was trying to reconcile, you know, say, you know, it's not going to happen for five billion years. And she went, oh, thank goodness, I thought you said five million. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, uh, we have 5,000 million years uh, to find somewhere else to live. Okay, let's get a bit bigger. We've done the solar system, we've done the Earth, we've, uh, we've done the sun and stars. Let's zoom out to our whole galaxy. Uh, so this is a picture of a tree. Behind the tree there is the galaxy, the Milky Way. Who's seen the Milky Way here, by the way? Actually, can you, still, can you see the Milky Way from this site? I bet it's kind of incredible. Maybe the lights are too bright. You have to go really out into the country to see the Milky Way. I saw it when I was on holiday for the first time. Uh, this is what our Milky Way looks like from inside. It looks like this lovely stripe of light across the sky. If you could fly out of the Milky Way, it would look like this. So this is like an outside picture of our Milky Way, and we are about here more or less. It's genuinely very difficult to talk about the scale of galaxies because they are just so ridiculously big they don't really fit into the human imagination. Uh, the Milky Way galaxy is so big if, if I give you a number in kilometers it would just sort of make your head explode. Um, so we tend to measure these enormous things in terms of how long they would take to cross at the speed of light, right? So speed of light, the fastest thing there is, in one year it covers 10 trillion kilometers and that's what we call a light year, 10 trillion kilometers. The Milky Way is 100,000 light years across, right? Even at the speed of light, it takes 100,000 years to cross the Milky Way. If anyone's seen Monty Python's Meaning of Life, uh, that's incredible. They have the galaxy song and they get all their numbers exactly right. It's fantastic. Um, my favorite way of talking about how big galaxies are, imagine that you could shrink everything down. You shrink reality down until the solar system is the size of a 10p coin, right? So imagine your 10p coin, the sun's in the middle and the orbit of Neptune is going around the edge. On that scale, the Milky Way galaxy is the size of all of North America. <laughs> so yes, we can say that we are here and that's true, but on the, the scales we're talking about, we're basically looking at a map of America and pointing out the location of like a coin lying in a field somewhere. So yes, we are there. You have to zoom in a very, very long way. And galaxies are completely extraordinary things, hundreds of thousands of millions of stars. And one of the most amazing things about them is that they're not static in space. Galaxies are all whizzing around. Uh, and so this leads us to our next supervillainous question, can you crash two galaxies together? And the answer is yes. 
and it looks amazing. So this is a real picture of uh, what we call a galaxy merger. Uh, it's a, the fancy word for two galaxies crashing together. These are two galaxies that are very, very similar to the Milky Way that are, have come together a couple of hundred million years ago and are undergoing this beautiful collision. Um, this is important for us to think about what the Milky Way would look like if it was crashing into another galaxy because that's going to happen to us. The Milky Way galaxy is on a collision course with our nearest neighbour. So if we zoom out even from the Milky Way, we can see this. This is our local group of galaxies. Uh, the big galaxy with we are here is the Milky Way. The other big one on the left-hand side is the Andromeda galaxy. It's like the Milky Way's twin. The Milky Way and the Andromeda galaxy are on a collision course. Uh, Andromeda is heading towards us at something like 200 kilometers per second, one of these sort of unfathomable speeds that you get in astronomy. But luckily it's so far away, even 200 kilometers per second is going to take billions and billions of years to reach us. It's going to collide with the Milky Way in about 5 billion years' time. Um, so we'll be too distracted by the sun dying to enjoy it, unfortunately. Um, we have a good idea of what it's going to look like because we can see these other galaxies having these really cool crashes. Um, and so we can sort of simulate what this is going to look like. So these are some photos, some simulations made of what the nighttime sky is going to look like. So we're getting back in our time machine and we're going forward in time now. This is what our nighttime sky is going to look like as we go forward and forward and forward in time. So this is our nighttime sky today, if you go to an extraordinarily lovely uh, site. Stepping forward a couple of billion years, the Andromeda galaxy is going to come closer. Stepping forward a couple of billion years, the Andromeda galaxy is going to come closer. And then in about five billion years' time, the collision is actually going to happen. Um, I'm very jealous of uh, these future astronomers living in five billion years' time. Right, The nighttime sky is going to look unbelievable. Um, so yeah, there's going to be a crash, the structure is going to be disrupted, the nighttime sky is going to look incredibly pretty, then the Andromeda galaxy is going to like swing around and out and then be pulled back in by the Milky Way's gravity and eventually smush together into one big giant galaxy. Now astronomers are terrible at naming things, um, so you, can, you might even be able to guess the name for that we've, we've given this galaxy. You take, so you take the Milky Way and you take Andromeda, the combined galaxy gets called Milkdromeda. Um, this is from the, the, from the same people that call the biggest telescope in the world the Very Large Telescope. Astronomers should not be in charge of naming things. Okay, so yeah, the answer is yes, you can crash two galaxies together. The good news I'll give you is that there is no doom and gloom for the solar system because when galaxies crash together, the individual stars are fine. There's so much space between the stars and the galaxy, there is basically no chance of them colliding. Right? Two stars don't collide when you crash galaxies together in the same way that two flies don't collide if they're buzzing around the Grand Canyon together. Right? There's just so much space in galaxies. Um, actually, the main side effect is going to be creation rather than destruction. Um, in these, like, these lovely pictures you saw, um, these sort of pinky bluey bits on the image are the new stars being made. So when the Milky Way and Andromeda crash together, it's just going to make loads of new stars get born. It's going to be very, very cool. Okay, we have about sort of 10-ish minutes left. Um, it wouldn't be a, a sort of super villainous uh, talk without answering the question, what happens if you throw someone into a black hole? Um, now, I, I'm sure ev every young supervillain has dreamed of throwing someone into a black hole. And, and so what happens next uh, sort of really like, stretches the laws of science to their absolute limit. So we'll do a quick introduction to black holes. This is a black hole. This is what a black hole would look like if you were floating around it. The edge of this little sort of bubble in space gets called the event horizon. And it's the point of no return on, uh, in a black hole. So next time you're flying around near a black hole, uh, you can do what you want. Uh, you can take your spaceship and you can fly, uh, fly around it as much as you want. What you can't do if you want to come back home is cross the event horizon. Once, you, once you've crossed the event horizon, there is no way to escape without breaking the laws of physics, uh, you know, which uh, makes scientists very unhappy. So once you've crossed the event horizon, that's it. You're definitely doomed. But the question is, what happens next? What happens once you've crossed the event horizon and gone down into a black hole? And to do that, we, we need to take a closer look inside the event horizon. So deep inside the event horizon, what's causing all this gravity? You know, a black hole is a, just an, a thing in the universe that has an enormous amount of gravity, and it pulls everything in, even light. That's why it's a black hole. 
if we zoom deep inside the event horizon, we find the thing, the source of all that gravity. And it turns out there is a tiny little speck in the middle of a black hole that gets called the singularity. Singularities are very strange. We don't really understand them. As far as we can tell, they are a tiny little speck, smaller than a grain of sand, uh, smaller than an atom, if you can believe that, that weighs as much as a star. Um, it's the leftover from when a really, really big star goes boom, right? So remember the sun, it won't explode because it's too small. When the biggest stars of all explode, the outer layers of the star explode off, but the inner layers get, uh, the inner core of the star gets smushed down, smaller and smaller and smaller, until it becomes a tiny little speck in space. I, I often think black holes are bad named, like badly named. When you think of a hole, you think of like a, a tunnel that you go through and you appear somewhere else, right? Black holes aren't tunnels that you can go and appear somewhere else. They are little specks in space that just weigh as much as a star. Um, singularities are very weird. Uh, we don't really understand them. Um, but the interesting thing is what happens if you fall into a black hole. So let's imagine that you are happily going along in your spaceship, and you're on your interstellar voyage, and then you do the very silly thing, and you cross the event horizon. At this point, you're absolutely doomed. There's nothing that can save you. So you've crossed the event horizon, you're going to fall down and down and down towards the singularity faster and faster and faster. Now something very strange starts happening now. So the strange thing about the singularity is that you, it's not normal to have so much gravitational pull concentrated in a really, really, really tiny place, right? The Earth has pretty strong gravity, that's why I can't jump off into space right now, but the, all the gravity is kind of distributed across this really big thing. It's not normal to have so much gravity coming from a speck, and things get weird when that happens. So as you're falling into the black hole, the way it works is, um, you fall closer and closer and closer, and the closer you get, the stronger the gravitational pull, and you would feel your feet, you know, if you imagine I'm falling in feet first, my feet are going to get pulled down more and more and more than my head, and I end up getting stretched out really, really, really long thin. And I tell you this because the real scientific word for this is my favorite word in the world, spaghettification. <laughs> I love that. See, astronomers have redeemed themselves for milk dromedar, right? So, uh, the idea that when you get fall into a black hole, you get pulled out into a piece of spaghetti, and that is called spaghettification, I think is absolutely wonderful. Um, so good news for anyone that's worried about black holes. Even the closest black hole is like a thousand light years away or more. So like no human has ever been anywhere near a black hole. Uh, okay, I can see I've got 10 minutes left, which is just enough time to talk about the end of the universe. Excellent. Okay, um, so our final supervillainous question is how will the universe die? Um, and so, yeah, importantly, this is not going to happen for billions and billions of years. So, what's happening to our universe now? So, right now, our universe is expanding, right? Right now, our universe is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, like a sort of like a balloon being blown up. But what's going to happen in the future of the universe? Um, you know, is it just going to expand forever? So we know that the universe is expanding right now. It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But we also know that gravity likes pulling things back together, right? So that's gravity's favorite thing to do, just try and pull things together. So let's do a thought experiment. Let's forget the expanding universe. Let's do a sort of like a, an imagination experiment. Um, go and throw a ball outside. What's going to happen next? And the answer is sort of, it depends on how hard you throw the ball. So normally, if you throw the ball like this, it can go, it's going to go up and up and up and up and up, and then eventually it will reach the maximum height, come back down and land. Um, this is like an analogy for one possible life story of the universe. Throwing the balls like the Big Bang, it get the universe getting bigger and bigger and bigger is like the ball going up. But then eventually, you know, all the stuff in the universe is trying to pull it back together. So the expansion might get slower and slower and slower and then reach, reach some maximum size. And eventually it comes down and down and down and then crunch. So this is one potential end for the universe. The universe might expand and expand and expand, but then gravity pulls it all back together again. And then there is something called the big crunch. So this is one potential death for the universe. The whole universe just gets squished to bits in a very, very, very long time in the future. This one's quite fun. Alternatively, uh, you know, we, we describe the universe as a ball that you're throwing up in the air. Let's say instead of me throwing the ball, it is, for example, Superman. Like, Superman could throw the ball much harder, right? If you're Superman, you could just throw the ball into space. 
And this is another potential life story for the universe. Maybe, the uni maybe there's just not enough stuff in the universe to pull it all back together again. And so the universe gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger forever. So yeah, maybe this is a bit more optimistic uh, view of the universe. The universe starts with the Big Bang, gets bigger and bigger and bigger forever. So when I first started getting really interested in, the, in like astronomy and, and, and cosmology, this was the big question. Is the universe going to end in a big crunch, or is the universe just going to drift bigger and bigger and bigger forever, like a sort of Superman throw of the universe? Um, let's have a vote, actually. Um, who thinks the universe is going to end up in a big crunch? I think this is a good way of finding the pessimist in the audience, maybe. Um, and who thinks the universe is just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger forever? Interesting. Okay. We know the answer because we did an experiment to figure out. So this was the question, right? We, were, we were, had the big crunch versus it gets called the big freeze sometimes. The universe just gets bigger and colder and bigger and colder forever. We did the experiment to find out. And the way you do the experiment is that you really, really carefully measure how fast the universe is expanding. So we got our telescopes and our best computers and tried to carefully measure exactly how fast the universe was expanding. And we got the answer. This was in the 90s. And the answer is none of the above. You're all wrong. Um, yes, we're definitely not heading for a big crunch. But it doesn't, we don't seem to live in a sort of Superman throw universe where the universe just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Turns out the universe seems to be speeding up. The universe is accelerating. This was so surprising. Um, if we go back to our throwing, throwing a tennis ball thing, if, you, if I went outside after this and threw a tennis ball in the air and it got faster and faster and faster and whooshed off into the sky, that would be the most surprising thing I ever saw. But that seems to be actually happening to the universe. Um, so yeah, the answer is that the universe is accelerating. There is something with its foot on the accelerator pedal of the universe that's making it get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, yeah, this is very, very strange. No one really understands it. I've taken you to the edge of physics, by the way. This is one of the biggest questions in science right now. Why is the universe getting blown up faster and faster and faster and faster? No one really knows. We've given this a name. We call it dark energy. This doesn't mean we understand it. Astronomers use the word dark to mean this is very weird and confusing and I don't understand this at all, right? Like dark matter is weird, confusing matter we don't understand. Dark energy is weird, confusing energy we don't understand. There's a lot of weird, confusing stuff in the universe. But dark energy gives us our nice third way that the universe might end. And that is that uh, the universe just gets bigger and bigger and bigger, faster and faster and faster, and ends up just sort of ripping itself apart like a wet tissue. Uh, so yeah, this is also a fun way for the universe to end. And so this is sort of where we're at right now. We have the big crunch where gravity wins, or we have the big freeze where the universe just gets bigger and bigger and bigger forever, or we have the big rip where dark energy just tears the universe to pieces. And we don't know what the answer is. We think it's almost certainly not the big crunch um, because the universe is speeding up, right? So we, yeah, the, the big crunch is probably out. Whether the universe, uh, you yeah, know, good news if you happen to live in the universe, right? We're not going to end up in some sort of fiery doom. But will the universe just get bigger and bigger and bigger forever in a nice chilled out way? Or would it get faster and faster and faster and tear itself to pieces like a piece of wet tissue? We honestly don't know the answer. And I think it's going to be very fun to find out. Um, I think that that's, this almost has to be the end because we've reached the end of the entire universe. Um, thank you so much for listening. Um, just before I finish, just to be uh, very self-promoting right at the end, no hard sell. Uh, but if you think this is fun, um, I have written a book all about this called Astrophysics for Supervillains. Um, I don't like being self-promoting, but my publishers have promised to chase me down and beat me with sticks if I don't mention this. Um, it's really, really fun. Um, it's, there's like loads of cool illustrations. There's a guy called Nathan Reed who's done the illustrations, and it's completely amazing. Uh, this is, is out on the 4th of July, wherever you buy books, um, if you want uh, more, uh, more fun astronomy space doom. Cool. Thank you very much, guys. I'll be in the Q&A tent for anyone that asks, uh, wants to ask anything at all about space. Thank you.